Hello there, friend. I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. The show that expands your mind and your pocketbook. Sometimes. Stacey? Obviously, this is the ninth birthday week of Bitcoin, so I'm going to stick on this, but I know also a lot of people have not only indigestion from the new year still, but they also have indigestion from the, you know, baptism by market crashes and volatility. You know, most people got into Bitcoin in 2017 and they only saw up, 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 parabolic up. And it was like, a, it was like pennies from heaven. It was like wonderful. And then a lot of volatility hit over Christmas. So I'm assuming there's a lot of indigestion and fear and panic and self-loathing and all sorts of stuff happening. So we're going to look at this article that Jameson Lopp, as we mentioned when we were hanging out with him for the Bitcoin birthday party last night, and I want to talk about, uh, take a step back to understand where Bitcoin came from and by understanding the genesis of the genesis block that happened on January 3rd, 2009 understand where the future might be, what might happen in nine years from now. Bitcoin and the rise of the cypherpunks. This is an important term to understand in the cypherpunks because right now, most of the attention for all the newbies involved in cryptocurrency is all about the corporate side, everything on CNBC, Bloomberg, what they're focusing on. And to, for us to watch CNBC and Bloomberg, it's quite interesting because it's, it's not at all what most people, it, all the OGs, like the original gangsters of Bitcoin, nobody really talks about. These aren't what are important to the Bitcoin community, but it's a corporate side and that's their side of the story. But we're looking at the origin, what happened. From Bitcoin to blockchain to distributed ledgers, the cryptocurrency space is fast evolving to the point where it can be difficult to see in which direction it is headed. But we're not without clues. While many of the innovations in the space are new, they are built on decades of work that led to this point. By tracing this history, we can understand the motivations behind the movement that spawned Bitcoin and share his vision for the future. So he starts with the history which was in the 70s. And at that time, cryptography was invented and created and developed by the US military, by the likes of the NSA and CIA, mostly NSA. So they developed cryptography. And it was at that time that all of the guys with the knowledge of that, this was considered basically state secret. It was like, you know, you can't just sell somebody uh, US military technology. This was considered military technology to tell them about cryptography, to tell them about encryption. So in the 70s was Crypto War One. There was Crypto War One, the cryptographers against the government, they wanted to open source it and share this encryption technology in order to keep the internet and communication private. This notion of privacy not secrecy, but privacy for the individual participating online. The idea of privacy is enshrined in the Constitution. Uh, clearly, you can interpret the, the right to assemble as, as the right to assemble and communicate privately. Um, think about uh, if that were not the case before the American Revolution, if there were no private meetings. And think about the American uh, Revolutionary War uh, without George Washington's ability to send message privately uh, out there in the, uh, the, the, the colonies to, to organize the, the war against the, uh, the empire. Yeah, well, he obviously needed secrecy. These were secrets he was keeping from the crown. And there is a legitimate reason for secrecy and all these early cryptographers did understand that you wanted secrets kept from your enemies and you know it, during world war ii we didn't want the nazis to have our our, our knowledge we used those you know native americans so they spoke the language that the nazis couldn't speak we were keeping information secret from them however there's privacy these curtains are open right now behind us because we're everybody's going to watch this on youtube we're not trying to hide anything we're happy for anybody to walk past there and look at us but if we were walking around naked or in our underwear or you know just hanging out with our friends here we'd be we, dutch <laughs> We would be, you could possibly be Dutch if you've ever been to Amsterdam. 
They don't seem to have curtains. They don't seem to mind not having much privacy. But nevertheless, we're not. We're American and we're in America. And you know, you, you want to keep some things private. You want your own intimate private space. This is what they want to maintain for the people. So then he goes into the 1980s. He lists a few of the key people. Remember, this, the title of this article is Bitcoin and the Rise of the Cypherpunks. Um, it's really, we can't get into it here. We don't have enough time, but you should go read it and find out the history of it. But it was in 1992 where the term cypherpunks was first uh, coined. San Francisco, of course, everything happens there. In 1992, Eric Hughes, Timothy C. May, and John Gilmore founded a small group that met monthly at Gilmore's company Cygnus Solutions in the San Francisco Bay Area. The group was humorously termed cypherpunks as a derivation of cypher and cyberpunk. The cypherpunks mailing list was formed at the same time, and just a few months later, Eric Hughes published a cypherpunks manifesto. He wrote, Privacy is necessary for an open society in the electronic age. Privacy is not secrecy. A private matter is something one does not want the world to know, but a secret matter is something one doesn't want anybody to know. Privacy is the power to selectively reveal oneself to the world. So this was the birth of the cypherpunk movement. And this, these are the people, the cypherpunks who invented the technology that is Bitcoin, that, that is the foundation upon which Bitcoin is built. Right. They, they we're getting into the how, how we got to the Genesis block and the idea of having private uh, messages sent uh, require, uh, electronically. Uh, re required advances in technology, and I believe at some point in this story, the government's work in creating uh, encryption was kind of released, wasn't it? It was uh, set out in, into the it was, wild. It was released finally after a big battles between these guys in the 90s in, in San Francisco and the government. And there were threats to arrest them. There were threats that they were uh, revealing state secrets. And that's important to understand. And that's in the, the, the documentation here that he's talking about. But then the technology here, just like, remember in the last episode, we talked about the pre-Cambrian explosion of all these ideas emerging. Here, here were the ideas that went into it. In, in the you know, biological life, there were creatures with seven eyes, creatures with 10 eyes, creatures with three eyes. You know, there were all sorts of attempts at various configurations. But you could see that eyes were going to be a good evolutionary design. It was, it was useful. And eventually, two eyes was the one that was settled on. That was the standard upon which many biological creatures emerged. Um, th that is what those guys, those cypher punks, were laying out the, um, basically, the standards upon which Bitcoin was built. And one of the things of how to keep your messages private, how to secure it, was to incentivize people to keep it private. And he mentions that in 1997, Dr. Adam Back created Hashcash, which was designed as an anti-spam mechanism that would essentially add a time and computational cost to sending email, thus making spam uneconomical. He envisioned that Hashcash would be easier for people to use than Dr. Chom's Digicash, which was created a decade earlier, since there was no need for the creation of an account. Hashcash even had some protection against double spending. Then later, he mentions that Dr. Wei Dei uh, published a proposal for B-Money, a practical way to enforce contractual agreements between anonymous actors. He described two interesting concepts that should sound familiar. First, a protocol in which every participant maintains a separate database of how much money belongs to user. Secondly, a variant of the first system where the accounts of who has how much money are kept by a subset of the participants who are incentivized to remain honest by putting their money on the line. So Bitcoin obviously copies some of those. It, 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 it evolved. It evolved from those concepts. Right, um, well, you know, I say often that if you look at gold, it's periodic element number 79. It has unique attributes that make it great for money. The thing about Bitcoin, did, not born in a vacuum, it has got 40 years of history to it, and it's evolved through all these technologies. It's a unique protocol. And it, like gold, it is uh, attracting a huge amount of capital for, for, for this uh, achievement. And you can't say that you can simply go out there and create another one. Uh, there are competitors, of course, just like there are competing species on planet Earth for energy and survival. Uh, but there's only one uh, apex predator, that is man. 
uh, at the moment before he dies from all the garbage. <laughs> then he goes into the 2000s. You mentioned gold, and that's one of the ideas. Like all the ideas from our history of money, from our history of privacy, of, of being humans and evolving higher intellectual, you know, you know, speaking freely amongst each other in these groups and speaking about ideas, no matter how crazy or stupid they might seem, and they eventually emerge into powerful, um, you know, robust systems. So he mentions Hal Finney, who recently passed away. Um, he, in 2004, uh, created work which was called the Reusable Proof of Work, which uh, built on facts, hash cash. And then, of course, Nick Zabo in 2005, he did BitGold, which was a digital collectible. So these ideas, obviously, um, you know, Bitcoin is often called Bit, uh, Gold 2.0. It's, it's, in fact, the IRS does qualify it as a commodity, as a property, an asset like gold. So you know, these are the, this is the evolution, and then um, he's predicting where the future will go. In this right. Article. Also, the white paper, the Satoshi white paper, is it's a Bitcoin a system for digital cash transmission, di moving digital cash, digital cash, I'm paraphrasing, um, which is, sets off most inquiries into this onto a, a bit of a skewed path because uh, they're looking at it in one use case, the, uh, the, the, the replacement for the payments use case, which is to ignore the entire history of this entire movement and, and to ignore everything else that this can possibly do, including uh, obvious references to gold. And as mentioned in the white paper, gold, it comes from derivation from uh, bit gold and has always been, store of value has always been key to this whole thing. Store of value, means of exchange, a payment system, or actually what the, the genesis, the origin of this is about privacy and maintaining right, your privacy. Right, that's the ultimate genesis is about privacy and the ability to protect that electronically ended up with where we are today. The cypherpunk movement is the Genesis movement. To understand, if you want to, no one even should buy any Bitcoin without first studying the cypherpunks. That's my feeling. Satoshi's white paper in 2008 did mention, it, he mentioned Hashcash and B Money, and he, in fact, Satoshi emailed Wei Day directly and mentioned that he learned about B Money from Dr. Back. So this is, he, Whoever Satoshi or they were came from the cypherpunk movement, and it's important to understand and research cypherpunk because many people have piled into Bitcoin. They might now be distressed about prices and blah, 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 but it's about an idea. It's much bigger than just prices or means right. of exchange. And, and Dr. Back is still alive. He's, he's on Twitter. He's on Twitter. And if you have a question, you know, if you want to find out what it's about, is it really Bitcoin Cash? Ask him. Ask Dr. Back what he thinks about it. He'll give you the straight dope. All right, well, we've got to take a break. We'll be back with a lot more right after the break. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to go to Miami. Speak with Richard Hart. He's a Bitcoin enthusiast who knows what he's talking about, actually, when it comes to technology and derivatives trading. I've been following his YouTube channel for quite some time now. Richard Hart, welcome. Thank you, Max. Pleasure being here. I guess we can't avoid. We got to look at this Bitcoin Cash. It's trading just now. Um, there's a lot of drama. It's the drama of the month club on Bitcoin always. You've got some insight into what's happening at Bitcoin Cash. Can you uh, dive into that a little bit, Richard? Well, I mean, it's real simple. If I, uh, if I made a, a Kaiser Report Cash and then, uh, you know, had somebody dress up like you, make a separate channel, and then told everyone that it was the real Max Kaiser, you'd be pretty upset about that. I mean, you put a lot of years and work into building up your brand and making something of quality to have someone else come along that had nearly no say in how the thing was built, never wrote an improvement proposal, never improved the code, you know, uh, basically a leech. You know, if a leech came along and said that uh, Max Kaiser Cash was the real Max Re Kaiser Report, you'd be pretty upset about that. And in the normal business world, it would be illegal. It's brand dilution. It's, uh, you know, stealing the goodwill of another company through confusion for your get rich quick project. So, you know, I don't like, uh, I don't like people that pretend to compete. I like real competition. Real competition means you get your own name, you build your own unique value add and you compete, you compete on price, you compete on features. You know, if you cheat and you just copy and confuse people and have the maximum, uh, similar, logo, the maximum similar name, the maximum similar user experience, but 
behind the scenes, it's totally fake. You know, the same developers don't work on your project. The technology is lagging behind, you know, uh, it, it's gross and it would be illegal in any legacy business, but, uh, because no one owns the Bitcoin.com, uh, or, you know, name, it's hard for them to find a legal standing by which to sue the imposters, which is unfortunate. So there's a couple of points here. First is, as you're getting into th there, it's plagiarism, clearly. Uh, the Bitcoin Cash is plagiarizing, they're, they're pirating the, the Bitcoin name. And also, uh, I guess you could uh, point to folks in this drama, like Roger Ver, for example, they have control over Bitcoin.com, the domain name, uh, which is um, very misleading because people go there having heard about Bitcoin uh, and then they're led into something completely different. Uh, you mentioned on your podcast before and, and your uh, YouTube channel that the developers that created Bitcoin, uh, an actor like Roger Ver has profited handsomely from that. Uh, so it's a real kick in the teeth to then plagiarize and steal the name, steal the brand and come up with this um, clone or to come up with a, um, you know, a bad Chinese imitation as some have called it. But there's another part of the drama in that now you've got financial media like CNBC, CNBC Fast Money are now entering into this without doing any due diligence, without doing any research. They're pushing what's clearly uh, a fraud and but this is this is I want to get your take on this because this is new to the whole crypto um, history and space in that you've got now CNBC, Bloomberg, and other mainstream financial news is now covering crypto. How is this going to play out? Your thoughts, Richard? Libertarians hate government uh, intervention, laws, rules. They want everything to be peer to peer. They don't want Big Brother involved, and they forget how the past really was. And every one of these laws and regulations came about because someone was doing something evil or shady. And as uh, time goes on, we've had these laws that have protected people. They forget why the law was first instant instantiated. So, you know, you've got uh, people shilling their own bags on financial media that are heavily invested. And that type of activity is not legal in the in the stock market. You know, you if you're if you're the CEO of a publicly listed company, you have to abide by strict rules regarding forward-looking statements and making promises to people and insider trading. And because cryptocurrencies are not regulated in that way, all of the problems that you saw in the past from people talking their own book, insider trading, you know, wash trading where you pump up the price by selling to yourself at increasingly higher prices, you know, uh, all of those problems are, they're back. They're here again. And it's just funny for, uh, for people that hate the government so much to complain and cry for government invention intervention when uh, things go wrong, like this Bcash launch on GDAX. They told everyone that it was going to come out in January. Then they surprise launched it. Why would you surprise launch a new financial product, increasing volatil uh, volatility, decreasing people's time to plan, decreasing people's time to have their coins where they need to be? Terribly, terribly stupid uh, to no one's benefit except insiders. And, you know, <laughs> if, if, uh, if there was ever a reason to see the financial regulators come down on cryptocurrency businesses in the United States, like going against your own roadmap, and uh, instantly listing something against your own advice days earlier. I couldn't think of a more clear reason to demand it. You mentioned uh, Coinbase there in GDAX, out there in San Francisco, headed up by uh, Brian Armstrong. And this has been a tension in the crypto community for a while because you've got the corporate crypto community. You've got, for example, Coinbase, you've got BitPay, you've got other big corporations who are tied in with VC money. They're looking for exit strategies. They're looking for qu quick profits. Uh, this has been a bit of a tension because, on the other hand, there's a part of the community, I guess you could call it the cypherpunk community, going back to the origins of Bitcoin uh, and the technology that came out of the cypherpunk movement. And so these two are now pitted against each other in a new way. Uh, on one hand, you could say this has been going on for since the creation uh, of Bitcoin. This has always been tension there. Uh, but uh, secondarily, or in another way, the question's got to be asked, if, in fact, we're recreating all the problems we had with Wall Street all over again. 
What's the prognosis for Bitcoin? Will it get through this latest drama? Uh, well, your thoughts on that? You know, you talk about conflict of interest. One of the investors in BitPay is Roger Ver. Roger Ver pumps Bcash hard. He holds a majority of his savings in Bcash, so he says publicly, and it would match with the clothing that he wears, which is always a BCH please shirt. Used to be a Bitcoin shirt, you know? Bitcoin Jesus turned into Bitcoin Judas. Now the only things he says about Bitcoin are negative and demeaning, which is pretty insulting based on the fact that his little Get Rich Quick project is built on the hard work and effort and labor of the Bitcoin coders that built it. You know, when he, he stole their work or is benefiting from their work when he forked it and didn't just take the code, took the name, took the logo. And uh, so now we don't have that problem just with Roger Ver. We also have that problem with Brian Armstrong from Coinbase. He doesn't like Bitcoin. He holds a majority of his wealth in Ethereum, so I hear. And every time you hear him speak about Bitcoin versus Ethereum, he says, you got to go where the developers are going, <laughs> which I think is pretty funny because that's where the developers are going to lose money. That's where they get lured into a honey trap of making uh, buggy smart contracts that lose millions of dollars. It's much harder to make buggy smart contracts in Bitcoin that lose millions of dollars because we've purposely restricted the attack surface. So it's harder to screw up and lose money. So less money is lost. Well, Brian Armstrong, one of the, you know, the CEO of the biggest onboarder in the United States right now, he doesn't like Bitcoin so much. So he hasn't implemented SegWit, which gives us twice the processing power and um, you know, more security, transaction mailability is cured, ASIC boost is cured, all these good things that came from uh, SegWit being implemented, you know, Brian Armstrong's team doesn't do. And his team also doesn't improve the Bitcoin protocol. No one on his uh, developer team makes any improvements to Bitcoin. Well, that's pretty terrible. You know, when their core product that they sell the most of, which is Bitcoin, he speaks negatively about publicly and his team does nothing to improve. And he rolls in the, this, this copy, this terrible copy that doesn't even have SegWit. It's bad and it's all conflict of interest. And, you know, I, I would be happy to see a financial regulator or the directors of Coinbase replace him as CEO because I do not believe he's treating their core product fairly. And if you saw this most recent launch of uh, the Bcash token uh, surprise release, which wrecked a lot of people's uh, entire wealth, you know, life savings lost. I don't, it doesn't seem like the kind of guy that should be in charge of a billion dollar endeavor. Let's uh, for, in a, for a moment here, um, talk about what your view is about, uh, let's say Bitcoin's pushback. I mean, what, what's happening on the other side of the equation? We have continued adoption, uh, continued awareness. Um, where, where do you see, where do you, give me some good news on Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin is the only product that has good legal uh, backing. So there's laws which specifically name Bitcoin that allow you to get good banking relationships with it, to get custodial services, for instance, through Gemini, uh, where a larger institution could purchase a bunch of Bitcoin and, and have a licensed, insured, bonded reason to believe it wouldn't get stolen or hacked. Uh, other cryptocurrencies don't have that. We also have the CME futures, the largest market in the entire planet. We have the CBOE, which does about a quarter of the volume, which is still quite amazing. We have the best developers in the entire world working on this. We've got first mover advantage, the greatest liquidity, the most secure platform, uh, software that you know isn't buggy, really works, doesn't have emergency down targeting problems like the fake imposters have had. And... Uh, you know, we do have some problems. We have a unit bias problem where, you know, people want to own a single coin of a thing. And since Millibits isn't popular, they choose things like Litecoin or Bcash because they're cheaper. And, you know, that puts uh, Bitcoin at a disadvantage on a product like Coinbase where people just want to buy. They just want to get in. They don't have time to figure out what's good and why. So they just click market buy. And, you know, they got, they used to have three products there they could market buy. Now they've got a fourth product, unfortunately, the worst possible product you could add or close. Um, and uh, it's going to be a fight, you know? If Wall Street wants to step in and, and start long in the futures, then Bitcoin's going to, you know, take more dominance and the altcoins will die more. If Wall Street doesn't want to step in and start long in that futures contract and take advantage of the, the new cool institutional relationships, 
then I think the altcoins are going to pump and uh, people are going to take advantage of that unit's bias and, and try and get that next, you know, smaller market cap, easier to pump coin that might give them a higher percentage return. It's going to be a fight. So Richard, uh, you've been in the game since I believe 2011. Uh, we started covering Bitcoin in 2011. Um, we, you know, we've been in it almost from the inception. We've seen uh, more than once, at least three or four times, massive corrections in the space. 50, yep. 60, 70%, 90% in one case. Where are we on the timeline there? Uh, do you, uh, I mean, first of all, I guess it's hard, instead of asking you that question, uh, let me ask you this. Can you stick around for a second segment? And we'll get into that in a second <laughs> segment. Yeah, I live. Anyway, thanks for being on this segment, uh, Richard Hart. And uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. I'd like to thank our guest, Richard Hart. He's got an outstanding YouTube channel. Check it out. If you want to catch us on Twitter, it's Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.